In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, it is part two of Leaf to Lean's Big Board 1.0. If you missed the first episode, be sure to check it out. He covered his top five prospects. But this is episode two in a two-part series where we cover Leaf's top 10 NBA prospects in his Big Board 1.0. Stay tuned for prospects six through 10. Shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board. And like I mentioned in the open, this is part two. Had to split the episode up into two parts. We recorded this a couple days ago. And so, again, this is part two. We covered one through five in the first episode. If you missed it, please check it out. If you're not subscribed to this channel, please subscribe, like, share, comment, get the notification bell or Click so you can get the notification bell because we are your source for NBA draft coverage five days per week. And in a day like today, you get two episodes, maybe, maybe even three. But before we get started, I wanted to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Now it has to be in all lowercase, but go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. All right, before we get into Leafs six through ten, I want to recap the first five picks. At number one, he had Alex Saar from the Perth Wildcats. At number two, he had Red Stars, Nikola Topic. At number three, he had Ron Holland from the G League Ignite. At number four, he went back to Europe with Zachary Riesesche, the French prospect who was playing for J.L. Borg. And at number five, the first college player to come off the board is Cody Williams from Colorado. All right, here we go. Six through ten, Leaf Tulings, Big Board 1.0, part two. So, all right, who's number six? Uh, number six for me is Matas Buzelis, and this is a guy that I'm not overly infatuated by uh, and with. I watched him play a couple times early in the season, and he struggled, and I'm just having a hard time unseeing it uh, in the sense that I like my alpha dog, and that's what he was billed as at the start of this process of being a possible number one pick to be able to will his way into points, to be able to will his team into competing, uh, to be able to create for others when he's in the, in the game by putting pressure on the defense. And he is very skilled, but it's so finesse oriented, even at six ten as a two guard, which is like, Oh, everyone talks about positional size, but I, he doesn't use his size to his advantage in the way that I typically like, like I just talked about Cody Williams being a jumbo size facilitator. And that's something I really like. Buzelis doesn't move me in that way. He is someone that I think is a luxury player that I don't see being a a star in the NBA. Luxury player. That is the first I've heard of that. Yeah, I had this conversation yesterday. Not not in terms of monetary luxury player, just like a a, a luxury to have on your team. Yeah, I I get it. (laughs) I was talking to someone yesterday, and um, we were just talking about different prospects, and he works for a team that has this wide range. He's like, we're a couple of injuries away from having to look at lottery picks, but then we're also really looking at guys that in the second round that could possibly come in and help and play like a, a defined role. And so he says he's been paying attention to the projected lottery guys. He was like, I don't like Bazellus. The team's theory is we'd much rather have guys that are not skilled, but play hard. And then we feel like we can develop some skill as opposed to a guy who's really, really skilled. And you just question how hard he plays and how much of an impact he wants to make on a game. And so he was totally down on, on Bazellus. And he's like, the flashes are there. Everything is there that you want, but he's like, the motor doesn't always run. So he has some real concerns. And so He's um says he's, he's going to monitor him more throughout the season, but he's just like the the games are the flashes are just really hot flashes in a sense, but then it's just you just have concerns about the toughness, the motor, and um, if he wants to basically maximize everything that he has. Well, that that's the thing is I I can't unsee 
like I can unsee a bad game for a lot of prospects. All all prospects have bad games. But for him, it's harder to unsee a game in which he didn't move the needle with his effort or in terms of being competitive. And yeah. I'm not saying necessarily that all of it's effort related, but when you're being competitive, you help you find a way to help your team, even if you're not shooting well. And I feel like for him, it's if he's shooting well, then other things open up. But that that comes first, as opposed to other players will their way into finding a way. To um, and so that that's a big thing for me. And I I hesitate to buy it. And the reason he's six for me over some guys like Jacoby Walter is just because I don't think their on ball capacities uh, are there in terms of being what a top six, top seven player is. Um, in the NBA, the way I traditionally view a draft. And that's probably because this draft is just devoid of that top tier talent. Yeah. And this particular scout mentioned if he could scale down Ron, cause he said he feels like Ron gets a little out of control, but he liked that because he's like, I can, at least I know at the very minimum, he's going to bring effort. And he was like, if I could just scale Maras up, and know that he's going to bring effort every night and, and defend and make an impact, he's like, he would be higher on him. All right, numbers, where are you at, seven? Yep, number seven. Uh, for me, that's Jacoby Walter. Uh, I really liked the very first game I saw of him against Auburn, and you yes. and I talked about that the day yeah. after, but I I don't see it on the ball. I, I see a very good shooter and someone who is somewhat, like, unbelievably coordinated and solidly athletic, but for some reason doesn't show off that skill set unless it's like a dire situation. And you see the shot is the best thing. And in today's day and age, if you can shoot, you're going to have a spot in the league, especially if you have athleticism, but he has no wiggle, like absolutely zero wiggle. I watched him play the other day against TCU and the mo closing moments, he got switched onto a, four, a senior center. Who's not particularly well-regarded, as a defender and created zero separation two separate times. And it's, I, it sounds silly, but he's not, he doesn't move the way I see a two guard with the capacity to become an all-star moves. And that's what I would like to be drafting. If he were top five, like I've seen many people have him that I would have considered having him after the first time I saw him, but his, his hips don't bend in the way that I would see someone on the ball. So I think he's always going to be an off ball shooter and that concerns me a little bit. But that said, I think he's that good of a shooter to where I would still take him in the top 10 pretty confidently in this class. Uh, and I think he's a solid enough functional athlete that defensively he shouldn't be a liability. And, and that's kind of where I'm at with him. I don't see that all-star potential I once saw. You know, that's what people said about Clay Thompson <laughs> coming out of school. And Clay was, what, the 11th pick or something yep. like that? I'm not saying that he's Clay Thompson. I've seen more KCP comparisons if he ends up becoming that type of defender. But I've also heard people say that KCP wasn't that good of a defender when he was at Georgia. All right, before we get into the second segment, let's talk about prize picks because prize picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America, and it is also the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports because you don't have to battle thousands of different players and pros and sharks. It is just you versus the projected numbers. All you have to do is pick two to six players, and you're just going against the numbers. And with basketball season in full swing, you can now pick combo projections across multiple leagues. Now, there's only one football game left, but let's just say – for Super Bowl weekend, you wanted to do a combo projection of Travis Kelsey and LeBron James, a combination of 10.5 three-pointers made and receptions. And let's say you wanted to play against some celebrities. You can play against Meek Mill and Andrew Schultz in the Community Plays League. Price Picks also has a reboot policy, so if one of your players gets injured in the first half, they automatically get rebooted. There is not another daily fantasy sports platform that offers an insurance policy. So go to prizepicks.com and use the promo code Locked On NBA, but it has to be in lowercase letters. Locked On NBA, you can get a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. So again, prizepicks.com. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 247 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, 
plus our national shows covering every league. So go to Locked On Sports today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24 hours a day, seven days a week streaming channel. All right, number eight. Who's number eight on your list? Uh, Rob Dillingham from Kentucky. This is a player that entering the season I had my doubts about. I thought he was a bit trigger happy, but I think part of that was the narrative surrounding him and it's how me. I, yep. yeah, and, and how how he fit into Kentucky. Like you knew he had unbelievable skill. Like you just watch a few clips, you're like, wow, that guy can do things very few can do. But you were like, oh, he's a chucker, and now he's going to a team that has all these guards already. They already have. What, who we thought were top 10 picks and, and Bradshaw and, and Edwards coming into the year that I, I still am pretty high on Bradshaw, but Edwards has fallen off the face of earth, and that's a guy I was never particularly high on. Shepard's been super efficient. DJ Wagner was supposed to be the guy with the ball in his hands, so what was his fit going to be? But I think it's pretty clear he's the best with the ball in his hands for Kentucky. He makes things happen. He's got tremendous pace. Uh, he's got agility and explosiveness he can create shots i think i think he's a better shooter than even percentages may indicate um and part of that's because he takes difficult shots because he can make them and then as a creator kentucky is the number two team in the country as assist to turnover who's their best passer by 10 miles it's him um so i i'm actually pretty high on him defensively and just in terms of his frame because he's so thin there are some questions at the next level but i think that's something I'll buy on a strength and conditioning program to improve him more than m many people can create a, a creator with the natural speed and, and coordination that Rob Dillingham possesses. Yeah. I'm a big Rob fan. Um, I think everybody was concerned about his fit. And I think most people are surprised, not surprised that his talent, but surprised at how well he's been able to fit in at Kentucky. And I, I talked to a scout yesterday. He's like, it's kind of off subject, but he says if Dewan Wagner or DJ Wagner wasn't the son of Dewan and Wilt Mag Wagner, he would not be starting. But he's like, he's only starting because of family ties. He's like, it's clear that Rob is is, is the better player uh, of the two. All right, number nine. Yeah, n number nine for me is T. John Salown. I, uh, I'm... I like him more than the consensus just because I, I think there are very few guys with difference-making athleticism that can shoot in this class. And I'm not saying I truly buy his shot, but just the stats are, are there so far. He's been able to shoot the ball decently, and I love the way he moves defensively. He's a disruptor. And offensively, there's more fluidity than a guy like Ryan Dunn or someone that I was high on entering the year who's just a defensive monster. But offensively, there's so much room to improve that you may, it makes you scared. Some people still have him in the lottery. I had him higher than anyone I'd ever spoken to or seen on Twitter entering this year because I knew about him talking to some Virginia people I know. But uh, but he just doesn't have the fluidity. Salon has that uh, fluidity uh, with the basketball. Without it, he moves well. Uh, on and off the basketball defensively, I think he's got switchability. So there's a bit of a shot in the dark for me, but I'm I'm higher than him on him than the consensus. Yeah, I'm very familiar with his game. Saw him last year at basketball at Outboarders. Still a little raw and unpolished, which could work in his favor because you're like the way he's shooting, which is surprising. I know he can shoot a little bit, but he's improved as a shooter. The athleticism is there. He's got some toughness. I wish he were like a better rebounder and shot blocker. Like it's it's very weird to me that with his tools and athleticism, like he's just not a really good rebounder or shot blocker. But I like him and I think he could be a I think where you have him at nine is realistic. And I think he could possibly go even higher on on draft night, like we saw with with uh Bilal Kulabali. Happy Super Bowl to all of those from FanDuel, which is America's number one one sports book and if you're like me the super bowl is it's all about scoring the best seat on the couch grabbing your favorite snacks and placing some super bets and FanDuel has so many ways i mean there's multiple ways for you to end your season with a w or two or maybe even three now you can bet on who will win the super bowl 58 but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown how many points will be scored and more and if you are a new customer, again, if you are a new customer, you can get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet or more wins. So go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That is FanDuel.com slash 
Locked On. All right, last one. Who is number 10? This is where it gets interesting for me. I really don't have anyone I, I love as a top 10 pick at 10, but I'm going to go with Reed Shepard. Uh, I don't think Reed Shepard is the defensive player that a lot of people liken him to. So I want to start off by saying that like he, his most often comparison that I've seen, and I guess I don't really look at too many other people's boards to try to influence my own, but I'd seen Derek white float around Twitter. I saw the Kevin O'Connor compared him to Derek white. Well, Derek white's an all NBA defender. I don't think Reed Shepard is as close to that. Even in college, he's a smart player who has excellent hands. His, his instincts are great. And he, he pokes the ball out at a very high level but he just doesn't have the feet to be that. That said, he's an excellent shooter, absolutely phenomenal shooter, and he plays the game unselfishly. So if there's a, a place for someone who can be a backup guard and and score the ball as a fifth starter, sixth man, off, uh, the, off creative action made by someone else and just be a supplementary floor spacer who can also – uh, assume some ball handling duties and, and get your team into sets. I think Reed Shepard can be that, but I don't see that that potential that I typically would associate with a top 10 pick uh, in Reed Shepard's game. Uh, I need to watch a little bit more of a few other players to evaluate and make, make that certain, but I can't knock that. He's shooting the lights out. He's playing winning basketball, and he's someone that has – good functional athleticism. I just don't see the defensive upside that has made so many people elevate him into this top seven conversation. I think 10 is probably higher than I'll actually have him. I think I'll, he'll probably be at the fringe of my lottery. But as of right now, I'm evaluating what I've seen so far rather than theoretical or, or words I've heard about their workouts later on. So I'll go with him at 10 for now. He has some real fans in NBA front offices. I, I spoke with someone that believes that he can run a team and that he can be a point guard. He thought that defensively it would be an issue, but he thought what he brings to the table was just kind of offset his lack of defense. He mentioned to me that he's like, he's strong. He's a better athlete than he's given credit for phenomenal shooter. Thought he was just a steady point guard. And he loved the, the pedigree of coming from like his dad and his mom and, he was really high on him. He had Reed inside of his, I want to say inside of his top seven prospects. So this draft is wild, man. This draft is so wild. I was at a game last night with multiple agents and just talking about prospects and how they listen to the podcast, trying to find some guys that probably haven't been mentioned because it could be somebody that hasn't been on a draft board that could end up being a first round pick because it's so wide open. So um, this draft class is pretty exciting for me. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. Once again, please like, subscribe, share, comment. That will help us grow the channel. Also, check out the NBA Big Board newsletter. Go to nbabigboard.com. I did a big board of my own, but it is 75 prospects deep. And I could have easily went to like 110. So check that out, nbabigboard.com. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with Leaf Tulane, and we are out. And thank you for checking out episode two, where Leaf covered his prospects 6 through 10 on his big board 1.0. In our next episode, me and my brother James, we are going to talk all about Bronny James, one of the more... <sighs> is divisive the word I want to use? I, I would say one of the more polarizing prospects in the 2024 NBA draft class, maybe 2025. But we share our thoughts on Bronny James and the pressure that he has to live up to living in the enormous footsteps of being LeBron James' son. And we're going to talk about his game, what we like about it, and our concerns. So stay tuned. The next episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast where we will cover Bronny James. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow. Leaf Tulane just dropped off his big board, and we are out of here.